On your Wednesday episode of Locked On Raptors, can you believe the Toronto Raptors traded Pascal Siakam for what they traded him for? That and other bad things from the 2023-24 Raptors season with Katie Heindel all coming up. Thanks for hanging. You are Locked On Raptors, your daily Toronto Raptors podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, what's going on? And welcome to another episode of Locked On Raptors, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. It is Wednesday, April the 24th, and I'm your host, Sean Woodley. I've been covering the Toronto Raptors now for 10 seasons on various platforms. You can find all my work over on the website that stinks at Woodley Sean. You can find the show on Instagram at Locked On Raptors. And of course, you can join us in the Locked On Raptors Discord server, which is the opposite of the website that stinks. It's a great place to come hang out, talk about the Raptors, talk about the playoffs, talk about the draft, talk about what you're cooking at home. It's a lovely little community we got building around the show where it's not just basketball. We talk about all kinds of weird nonsense over there. Come be part of our listener family. Link in the description of the podcast. It's free to join as always of course you can find the show on your favorite podcast app of your choosing for the audio feeds you can follow subscribe rate review tell a friend always appreciated when you support the show however you support the show you can also do that by going to youtube and subscribing to the youtube channel hitting the notification bell and getting a heads up every single time the show goes live or premieres via push notification it's a wonderful thing so go ahead and do that thanks for supporting the show in whichever way you choose to do so today's show is brought to you by FanDuel. make every moment more right now new customers get 150 bucks in bonus bets guaranteed that's 150 bucks win or lose visit fanduel.com slash locked on to get started we will get started here bringing in today's guest as we continue our three-part series on the good the bad and the hmm from this toronto raptors season of course this was a routine segment on the heels of toronto raptors basketball games over the course of the season where we talked about a thing we liked a thing we didn't like and a thing that had us a bit intrigued after each game we're doing the full season version here last week we did the good with today's guest and today we will dive into the bad with katie Heindel from Basketball Feelings. Katie, how the hell are you? I'm doing okay. I'm doing okay. Thrilled to have you. Usually when I have you on the show, Katie, I like to talk about, uh, you know, more uplifting things, I was fun gonna things, say. joyful mm-hmm. things. Today, <laughs> we're getting into the muck and it's a, it's a strange tonal situation for a Katie episode. Uh, before we dive into some stuff on the, that didn't go so well for the Raptors this season, I want to ask you, uh, have you prepared yourself emotionally for a Pascal Siakam versus OG Ananobi's second round of the playoffs? I didn't actually think about that, but yeah, I feel like... Um... <laughs> Something about it feels less, it feels like it will be a lot more fun than the Mm. first time Kyle and DeMar, Mm. you know, played in a high stakes game against each other. Sure. I mean, they're both on good teams that suit them very well. I'd say probably suit them better than the Raptors did when they Mm -hmm. were traded from the Raptors. Uh, And like things have been going swimmingly for them both. They sure have, Katie, which leads me into my first bad thing from the 2023-24 <laughs> season. I uh, set it up there. I'm a professional podcaster, mm-hmm. Katie. Uh, we will get into many things we thought were bad about this year. But for me, I think you have to start with the Pascal Siakam trade. Whether you thought the Raptors needed to move on from Siakam or not, I think it's pretty clear the return they got for an all NBA player who wanted to be in Toronto, who you could have extended at any time, who you waited until the last you know couple of weeks of your leverage play of whatever you were trying to do to pull off a trade that was severely below value. It was bad, Katie. It was a bad trade. I don't <laughs> like it one bit. And it was you know a nice little twisting of the knife last night as Pascal Siakam puts up 37, 10, and 6, or 37, and 11, and 6 on ridiculous shooting efficiency for the Indiana Pacers in a playoff win last night. Uh, he's been the best player on the Pacers in the playoffs, bar none, not even remotely close. He's carrying that team right now through two games. And to me, it's just all the more reason why the Raptors should have just let that quickly bear it, Siakam, Barnes, Quartet, cook for a little bit longer we got those three and a half four beautiful games of basketball where it all worked and then yaka purtle got hurt and everything went to you know crap and the trade happened as it did and and i just think 
looking at the return they got, the pick ending up 19th uh, from the Pacers for this season, the uh, very, very clear sort of gap in the Raptors lineups going forward in terms of just like big wing type players who they could really use to fill in the starting lineup they have going forward. Um, the fact that they have a bunch of cap space potentially this summer and are going to go and presumably use it on a player who is worse than Pascal Siakam. It all just feels like a big old punch in the gut, Katie. I do not like this trade one bit. And I'm not just saying this because Pascal was awesome last night. People who listen to this podcast know I've been on this train for a while. I'm sure plenty of people have stopped listening to the podcast (laughs) because I've been on this train for a while. But Katie, the Pascal Siakam trade to me, clearly the worst part about this season. And uh, I have a feeling it's going to age even worse as Siakam probably keeps on doing really cool things with the Pacers over the next many, many years. Yeah, you know, I'm kind of of two minds of this, um, mm-hmm. as I sort of alluded to. I think Pascal needed to go somewhere else to take a jump. Sometimes when athletes do that, um, it does unfortunately seem like it happens with teams like either literally the Raptors or a lot like the Raptors and they go to, you know, other teams. Because like, the Pacers aren't like us. We talked about OG. Obviously, the Knicks are a big market, but the Pacers aren't. So it's like a similar mm-hmm. kind of market situation. But I think that was a team built more or less and in a in a stage of its evolution equipped to have him. Sure. And to have him do the things that he excels at and to also like shine at those things and get better at those things. And that wasn't the case any longer with the Raptors. Some of that was by desi- like unfortunate design, right? And like the procrastination, I think, to make a decision by the front office, which had a real bad trickle down effect, which we'll get to. Mm-hmm. Um And some of that, I think, is just natural maturation of where Pascal's at in his career. So, yes, of course, it's it's easy and nostalgic to think it could have been exactly like this had he stayed with Toronto. I just I do think that ship had sailed. So I'll agree that it had sailed before the OG trade. Like, Mm -hmm. if you want to tell me that it wasn't working, that something had to change, that Siakam had to go before December 30th totally on board that team did not make any sense they weren't playing for one another they weren't connected even though scotty and pascal individually were having really nice seasons and scotty's breakout was happening with pascal very much on the team the majority of his breakout this season took place with pascal on the team siakam found his place was as efficient as he's been since the 2018-19 season playing alongside scotty in this kind of busted roster you want to say before December 30th that it had, the, the, the ship had sailed, that something had to change, I'm totally on board. The Emmanuel Quickly edition changed everything. And I do very much believe that Quickly could have been the bridge between Siakam and Barnes and their stylistic overlap, which we, we talked about a lot at the early part of the season. That stylistic overlap was becoming less of a concern as Siakam became more of this really sort of devastating off-ball player who could drive into sort of use the space that teams were giving him Mm -hmm. liberally to go and shoot like no one chews up that space and turns it into a weapon quite like Pascal Siakam Scotty Barnes was shooting 38 percent with Pascal on the team Siakam leaves it's not a coincidence that Scotty Barnes's three-point proficiency drops off like they were making it work and I think the way quickly could have tied the, the whole thing together with his Spacing, obviously, above the break, the extra playmaking he could have to sort of work with both of those guys off of the ball as excellent cutters and off-ball movers like they are. There was a team there. And let me ask you this, Katie. Like, we're seeing the Magic right now. They were like the darlings of this season. I think they have a lot of questions to answer going forward. They can't score worth a lick right now. I don't see how a quickly Barrett, Barnes, Siakam group given 18 months to marinate before financial decisions have to be made with a Pirtle or a Barrett or Siakam, whatever, but given some time to work together, I don't know how you go into next season and don't view a quickly Barnes Barrett Siakam quartet as like a better core than what the magic have right now, which is two really good players. And then a bunch of kind of, okay, where's this all fit together? Like they could have been the darlings of next season with that group. I am fully convinced. And then you figure it out from there, whether there's another trade to level up or you, you eventually make the Siaka move for probably the same piddly return you got at this year's deadline. I, I just I don't see a world in which it was better for the Raptors to cut bait on this early when well, they're going to be do. looking for a Siakam like player in the summer. Please, Katie, tell because me because it's what you're describing as a fantasy <laughs> that doesn't <laughs> exist. So I definitely do. Mm-hmm. Um, also, I think there's not a, we're not talking about the magic, but like 
a lot of those, I don't think a lot of those problems are very substantial. I think a lot of that has to do with the team in the playoffs for the first time and being like, mm. oh, right. The speed of this is a lot different and we're not re really adjusting to it. They properly. need a guard, Katie. They don't have a guard. Like they'll figure it out. And I think that's kind of like, to me, that is also in line with what you're saying with that combo of why it might not have worked or you know what sean like it would have worked until it didn't and then they would have mm. been back at the exact same quandary like it this is a bit this is a bit like circumstantial with what happened with pascal mm -hmm. but i don't think it was ever going to get to the point where like no one was ever really settled about Pascal in the, either in the front office and the fan base. Like there was, he was always a question mark. I didn't, you and I didn't agree with that. You know, yeah, like, I think that's kind wrong. Of, <laughs> yeah. We were like, this doesn't have to be the way, but sometimes mm -hmm. that happens with certain players for whatever, you know, myriad reasons. Uh, and I think with him, like the question would have always been Pascal. It would have, and even if they were playing well, the question would have then have been like, okay, well, is he going to stay or like, you know, there is also injuries to, to think about, right? Like if that, you know, the Yaka Pirtle injury happened as it did and Pascal still stayed, it would have thrown a wrench into the whole circumstance that you're outlining. So I'm kind of just a little, it's still, to me, it's like, it, it's a bit of a stalling tactic. Mm -hmm. sure. Yeah, they would have been, I think, good and a lot of fun to watch. I don't know if like competitively their ceiling was, would be at like a playoff I don't know. They automatically would have been in a playoff or like play in situation with that group. I really don't know. And I like, frankly, I just, I have a hard time diminishing the trade because of how happy I am for Pascal and like what he gets to do now to under some brighter lights that he deserves. That's, yeah. That's totally fair. Like I'm uh, rooting Sometimes for Sometimes it's okay to be yeah. like, you guys blew it. Yeah. And like, yeah, that sucks. But like, I think in some ways, the front office is the front office blew it, um, and that is a decision. You know, it it may go down as a bad. This was like a bad, not just one trade decision, but kind of a series of decisions mm -hmm. that led that like forced the hand or kind of led to it when it when they did. So, mm -hmm. I think it's fair to say that too. It's fair to say like what to to mourn what could have been, but also to be like, yeah, it's pretty easy, simple. They blew it, but like Pascal went on to bigger and better things. Damn you, Katie, and your reasonability. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I, look, there, there's still it's like I, the trade was bad. I think it stays bad until, you know, the Raptors pull rabbits out of hats with all of the picks and flexibility they got in exchange for Pascal Siakam. If they turn pick number 19 into an all-star, then everyone feels a little bit better about this five years mm -hmm. from now. All of that. Sure. Like there's still plenty to be written on this trade. I just, for me, the sort of process leading up to it was so haphazard and poor and telegraphed and they sort of like destroyed their own leverage in the whole thing. Like, I think it's all worth heavy critique. That said, there's every possibility that they turn the page this summer. They make the right moves and things are on the up and up. They have quickly who like the reason I was so bullish on the fit with Siakam and Barnes is because I'm super bullish on quickly. He's still there. He's still on the team. You can feel good about that. It's just, I think the alternative of just having the really good team together that could have been a very good team that you then figured out more down the line was better than this sort of murk of uncertainty of what comes next and how they fill out the rest of this roster. They but simply could have filled out the rest of this roster. But you're just Pascal Siakam. <laughs> it's still just a made up thing. <laughs> it's all a made up thing, Katie. It's make believe. It's professional sports. It's imagination. Um, we'll come back on the other side, Katie. Get into some more stuff that didn't go so hot for your Toronto Raptors this season, including uh, just the general air of indecisiveness and uncertainty that hung over the team for a very long time. We'll get to that coming up in just one sec. Today's show is brought to you by DoorDash. This Mother's Day, get something thoughtful for mom on DoorDash. Surprise her from wherever you are with fresh bouquets, the latest tech, gift cards, self-care treats, and more to make her day that much better. My mom lives pretty far away out in the boonies, and it's hard to see her on all the holidays I want to see her on. I'm probably not going to see her on Mother's Day, Mother's day this year because I'll be watching the NBA draft lottery, of course. Um, it's just not going to be in the cards. But with DoorDash, I can send her whatever I want to send her very easily. I've actually done this before on her birthday on Mother's Day. 
Mother's Day. Ordered her dinner from far away to show her I'm thinking about her and all that good stuff. Also, call your mom on Mother's Day. Don't just send her DoorDash. Call her as well. Get all your Mother's Day gifts all in one place and get 50% off your next order up to $15 when you spend $15 plus on your next flower convenience grocery or retail order now with the code LOCKEDONNBA. That's LOCKEDONNBA. Order using DoorDash today. Terms apply. Today's show is also brought to you by our friends over at Monopoly Go. You know me. I've talked about it already. I love Monopoly. It's super fun, but my family doesn't like to play with me all the time because I'm mean when I play Monopoly, but that's okay. I can be mean to my friends on Monopoly Go instead of being mean to my family on the classic board game. Yes, it's a wonderful thing to play. You've probably heard of it by now. Over 150 million people have downloaded it. It's a great twist on Monopoly where you play on not one, but hundreds of Monopoly boards in crazy locations, building up amazing cities that bring you big money. But the best part is messing with your pals. Of course, you can charge them rent on iconic properties, just like Monopoly. And you can also heist their vaults for riches for yourself. Plus the leaderboards show you who the biggest Monopoly tycoon is. It's not just your competitive side that's going to love it, though. You can team up with friends and people all around the world in time tournaments to earn huge rewards. Go play Monopoly Go today. Tons of fun. Just go set it up in the game and join your friends. Download Monopoly Go for free, the App Store or Google Play. Continuing on here, our conversation about the stuff that was not so hot about the 2023-24 Toronto Raptors went a little long in the Pascal Siakam thing, appreciative of Katie, yeah. bringing me <laughs> off the ledge a little bit. But Katie, I will give it over to you now. Uh, what is your first thing that went badly for your Toronto Raptors this season? I mean, do you just want me to run through all of them to like <laughs> speed around it? We will we'll speed around little? in the last segment. Let's spend okay. some time on one big one here. And then, yeah, last segment, we'll just rattle, rapid fire through some stuff we hated. Okay. Um, I mean, I kind of touched on it and I think it was the indecisiveness for me to, mm -hmm. to start off this season. Granted, that was a trickle down from, I'd say the last two seasons, um, of just understanding which move to make and when, uh, I, and I like, you know, I, I say this all with the fact that I do get it from a front office perspective. A lot of the decisions they had to make had to do with cutting ties with guys that they've had in their system, from like their developmental stages with the 905, you know what I mean? And also mm -hmm. representative of a championship core, you know, that was kind of no more. Uh, and like, there's this desire always in basketball to, I'd say it's like a rarer thing to be patient, right? And that's something I do give this front office credit for most of the time. Mm -hmm. They're not afraid to be patient and take flack for it because that's not really something that exists in, you know, the NBA landscape. So, so much and so and like so easily um but that's that all said like they really did drag their feet i think the relationship suffered because of it mm -hmm. i think because of that indecisiveness trickling down it, it you know it went into kind of like the lineup situation who's gonna play i think it had to you saw a lot of like the moving the moving the people that came in and out of this roster, 29 people this whole season, not just 30, because the, Katie, they hit 30, oh, 30. Okay, yeah, cool. Bleak Williams, the uh, yeah. class, you were going to hang his banner. <laughs> okay. Not just because of injuries, because I understand that was a chunk of it too. But when you look at someone like Dennis Schroeder, who I honestly do forget sometimes who was on the team <laughs> this year. And I feel bad for that guy. Cause like, you know, he was touted it and I'm sure he was sold on like, you're our, point guard now like you're our guy mm -hmm. and then they were very quick to move off of him when they realized oh wait that's like a huge misfit i'd say portal to a degree is the same though he can make up for it a little bit easier and i think he has some credibility a lot of credibility within the franchise and of course like his skill set um but that was someone who they brought in because it was like a good pascal fit but if there was ever a sense of like wait a second we're kind of unsure about what we're going to do with pascal it just seems a bit strange to not kind of look at the for for a franchise that quite often you think looks at the long term ramifications of decisions, mm. and that's why it takes so long for them to make decisions. It feels strange that they weren't like, oh, you know, this the indecisiveness that's been plaguing us for seasons now might actually come around to bite us, which it did in a big way, uh, because you also have everything else butting up against that, which is like the development of Scotty Barnes and where he's at in that stage. And if he's your guy, you'd also think you'd want to surround him with as much stability right? Mm -hmm. And assurance 100%. as you possibly could. And so I think like the ramifications of that are just things that I've noticed probably in ways that one, they, they wouldn't have anticipated, but maybe couldn't have. 
but without like letting the front office totally off the hook, I think there are some things that they knew and were just sort of dragging their heels on as long as they possibly could. But I'm not saying any of it is so devastating that they can't come back and weren't like making strides to come back for it. We talked a lot about Darko mm -hmm. and his coaching in the last last week's episode. And I think he's a huge reason there has been any stability this season, you know, throughout totally. that. And he's worked really, worked really hard to achieve that. Um, so yeah, like these are things that they can come back from in some ways, but then there's other ways where I think, you know, there's, there, there might be damage or like hurt feelings still in some of those relationships. And I think the Pascal Siakam trade, the Ojan and Obi trade is they're also like, as much as those trades were maybe practical realities by the time they happen, the way that they happen is probably not. Byproducts of indecision. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 I, I think. You know, this honestly was maybe even more than like the Pascal trade handling. This was the thing that baffled me the most this year was the just they came into the year seemingly not having learned from what went wrong the season prior, where mm -hmm. the big sort of cloud hanging over the 41 and 41 team in 22 23 was the Fred Van Vliet free agency and then the Gary Trent Jr. free agency and then eventually the Yaka Pertle free agency when they traded for him and the contractual uncertainty that hung over everything that poisoned the well, mm -hmm. they didn't learn from that. And just like, Oh, let's just like run it back with more contractual uncertainty going into this season. Like that was the thing that baffled me the most. I know they couldn't have done much about the OG contracting. Like they couldn't extend him for a number he was going to take. And so mm -hmm. you were going into the season with the uncertainty there, but they pretty clearly telegraphed all summer long, by like not talking to Pascal Siakam and ghosting him like a teenager um, that like, we don't want you on the team anymore. And if you didn't want him on the team, you should have just traded him in the summer, come into the season clean, not force Darko Ryakovich to like dance around saying his name on the, the, the first day of the season at media day, not have Masai Ujiri make weird veiled comments that were probably more about Fred Van Vliet than they were about Pascal Siakam, but they sure seemed like they were about Pascal Siakam at the time. Like mm -hmm. you invited this cloud from the previous year and said hey stick with us cloud let's hang so hang over us until the end of the, the the 2023 calendar year until we finally get some clarity on things and that was just really concerning to me that they just didn't learn from that thankfully it seems like going forward they don't have to worry about that like they'll sign quickly i'm sure this summer they'll extend scotty barnes this summer RJ Barrett's under contract for three more years, Pirtle under contract for three more years. Like it seems like they kind of have their dudes set now, which is mm -hmm. great, but it sucks that half of this season got burned by sort of waiting for that fog of un un uncertainty and murkiness to clear. A and what did you get for it at, at the end of the day for all of your waiting? It you didn't benefit from taking it down to the wire. The OG trade, an absolute home run, you killed it, but the Pascal trade was I think a direct byproduct of losing all your leverage and telegraphing all season. You wanted to trade the guy and refusing to rescind on that. And you get, you end up where you are. So yeah, I think the uncertainty was a massive thing. And hopefully Katie is a thing we can put behind us going into next season. Um, well, I guess we can start rapid firing some stuff here. We'll, we'll, we'll come back Katie in just a sec and we will just go back and forth. We'll just go until we run out of stuff that was bad. How about <laughs> that? Uh, we'll come back on the other side and get through the rest of the bad from the 2023, 24 season before turning the page to better days ahead coming up in just one sec. Today's show is brought to you by FanDuel, the number one sports book in North America. It's playoff time in the NBA and NHL. Baseball is in full swing, and FanDuel is your place to bet on every game. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. That's $150 win or lose no matter what you're betting on. Bet on everything from slap shots to home runs to slam dunks, all in an app that is safe, secure, and easy to use. I feel like the easy money right now is just betting on the Lakers to lose to the Denver Nuggets. It's like a full-on Lebronto situation in reverse where the Nuggets just own the Lakers. Don't bet on the Lakers to win. Bet them on, bet on them to lose, and maybe you'll have some luck. Maybe you do a little same-game parlay with some Nuggets players as well, and you can have some fun with that too. All sorts of ways to bet, whether it's spreads, whether it's same-game parlays. It's all there for you on the super easy-to-use FanDuel app. What are you waiting for? Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to make your first bet an automatic win. FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Please play responsibly. Today's show is also brought to you by BetterHelp. And look, 
sometimes you just got to have someone to talk to. Having someone who's unbiased in your life, no agenda, no baggage, who can just help guide you through the tough decisions that life throws at you, whether you're dealing with a, a personal crossroads, with a career change, or whatever it might be. You have a relationship you want to give some more TLC to. You want to help understand yourself better. Therapy can be that avenue for you. I know a ton of people who have really benefited from therapy. It just helps to talk it out, have it all out there, and make the decisions that you can for your life going forward that are in line with your values. And a therapist can help you establish and figure out what those things are. Therapy can be different for everyone. Most of us have bigger problems than our favorite sports team, and it's important to get things off your chest every once in a while. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be flexible and suited to your schedule. Visit BetterHelp.com slash LockedOnNBA to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash LockedOnNBA. Rounding things out here with Katie Heindel from Basketball Feelings, our absolute fave, uh, as we uh, continue to talk about some bad stuff that uh, happened for the Toronto Raptors this season. As we continue our good, bad, and hmm three-part series, we'll talk about the hmm next week, which I'm very excited for, Katie. So hopeful, so exciting, so fantastical. Uh, <laughs> that's what we like to dabble in today. Um, let's, uh, before we get into our rapid fire of other bad stuff we didn't like about this no good season, a uh, reminder, Locked On Sports Today 24-7 is a great place to be right now as playoffs are happening. NBA, NHL, you got the NFL draft this week. All sorts of great coverage from our local shows covering the biggest stories in sports all day long for free on the Locked On Sports Today 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube. Lots of great mock draft stuff that's out over there as well. If you're an NFL fan, it's there. It's Go, go check it out. It's a great thing to have on, on all day while you work. All right, Katie. More bad stuff. Let's just uh, we'll just play ping pong here. Bad ping pong. I'll throw it to you first. You're you're serving. What's your first thing uh, you want to run through here that was bad from this season? Rapid fire style. Ah, uh, the injuries that yeah. kind of stunk. Um, mm -hmm. I think it stinks for development. You know, for somebody like Scotty Barnes, though. The silver lining there is he's not going to lose such a big step. It's not like the team was looking at a long postseason run sure. or anything like that, that he was going to miss out on. It also seems that most of the injuries are, we're still going to see everybody coming back like healthy, you know, and ready for next season. Um, but it certainly derailed progress. And I think it derailed like a nice rhythm that was going, um, which leads to my second rapid fire, which was just the inconsistencies that we saw in play. Again, some of this is due to injuries and like you can't really coach around that. But I also think there were sometimes like my one criticism uh, of the coaching staff and like a, the technical sense is the fact that because they had, they didn't really know who they had all the time. Mm -hmm. Actually, no, despite knowing who they had or did not have, they still were kind of insisting at first, I think on this deep rotation Mm -hmm. that the team wasn't really ready or equipped for. So, and I think there could have been something really learned, like learned there. It's like lean into the people that you have and identify their strengths and their skill sets and try not to push it, especially if you've got such an inconsistent lineup. Yeah, I think those are great points. I think to kind of build on your first one, Katie, but one of my bads is kind of getting robbed of a pretty fun last 20-ish games, like kind of getting robbed of what the Rockets had a little bit, maybe a less extreme version, but... I do think we were seeing that team coalesce into something pretty interesting before Scotty Barnes got hurt. Um, you know, right up until that first half against the Warriors, where the Warriors were at a time of the year, they were playing very well. And it seemed like the Raptors were very much going to hang in, perhaps win that game. Um, you know, Scotty was playing excellent ball that week. There were a couple days coming off of that Pacers win on the road. That was one of the high watermarks of the season. Um, you know, it was really coming together there. And, and you know, do they make the plan? I don't know. Well, maybe, maybe not. Like the Hawks were fine down the stretch. There weren't any great shakes. I think they certainly would have made it interesting instead of losing 15 games in a row <laughs> right after that all went down. Um, and so, yeah, I think it was a little disappointing. Those last 20 games could have been some rip roaring, low stakes fun, and it wasn't. And we got robbed of that. But Hopefully everyone's healthy, good to go into next season. And hopefully that is sort of a portend of things to come, right? Even if it's, um, you know, take some time to kind of get back to where they had gotten with that group after 10, 12 games of playing together. Um, I think there's something there with the Scotty, quickly, Barrett, Grady, Dick, uh, Pirtle, Olenek. Like there's some interesting mm -hmm. stuff with this team going into next season, no doubt. And it's a shame we didn't get to see it down the stretch. Um, rapid fire for me, Katie, one bad, uh, fringy bench wings. <laughs> Didn't get a whole lot from your Jalen McDaniels, your Otto Porter's Jr., your Ochai Abaji even, Jordan Wara. Not so hot. Uh, none of those guys 
necessarily covering themselves in glory. I know Wara had a couple of big offensive games. I also don't know if I've ever seen a worse defensive player at six foot eight or more. Uh, it's tough to watch. McDaniel's obviously just a complete train wreck basically all season long. Um, Porter injuries it sucks. There were some moments there. I, I, a couple of weeks ago, I did I looked back at some of the best games of the season, Katie. And one of them was that game against the Bucks in the early going, I think November the 1st. Mm -hmm. Otto Porter played heavy minutes in that game. It was beautiful. The team absolutely rocked in that game. And it was just kind of like it for Otto Porter in the rotation. Uh, it, very much a bummer there. Um, Abaji, we'll see, did not have himself a strong close, especially on the offensive end. I think the defense has a long way to go as well. Uh, he's a big project, a massive, massive summer for Ochai Abaji. But yeah, fringy bench wings leaving the Raptors in a position where I, I think anything's on the table when it comes to their wing situation. I don't think anyone has any sort of guaranteed spot filling in the gaps between the Raptors core players going into next season. Uh, what's your next uh, thing that was bad, Katie? I feel like I already rapid fired all of them. Oh, come on, Katie. There's got to be more bad from this. Season. No, I was nope. actually just thinking about this and I was like, not, I know this is the bad episode, but I do feel like all the bad things that we've mentioned aren't so bad that there's like mm. some kind of fundamental existential crisis that the team has to deal with this summer, which is sure. honestly a nice place to be in because of the last few off seasons certainly felt like that when you had arguably a bed, a quote, better and more intact roster. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm not like, I don't actually feel too terrible about the team, despite how terrible of basketball they were kind of playing at the end of the season. It was still fun to watch. Yeah. And I swear this isn't just like amnesia, yeah. you know, and like my <laughs> brain kind of scraping itself clean of this season. Now that it's over, uh, I generally think like a lot of the bad things are out of the way. And There's a stealth. Sorry. Yeah. No, no, no. Um, I'm like, and I'm, I don't want to just like invent a, a bad thing for the sake of the theme. Fair enough. Um, the, the, my, here's a stealth bad thing. Okay. Didn't love how Chris Boucher was handled this season. Like it was just like oh, a yeah. weird yeah. thing with him where it was like, oh yeah, like he, he's part of the rotation. He's playing early on in the year, and then he was kind of in and out, and then coming into the deadline, all the reporting is, oh, he's definitely going to be traded for basically any offer that the Raptors can get. It seemed like there was like the whole goodbye in the final game before mm -hmm. he, he went away or before the, the deadline came. He's on the team after. He doesn't really play at all after. Then he gets hurt. And that stunk after he played some you know nice games in that stretch before he got hurt, like after the deadline there. Um, yeah, just like a, a bummer of a year for a guy who is like the lone remaining member of the championship team. Um, you know, the, the, the sort of last relic of a bygone era with this franchise. And uh, you know, I, I hope things end on a more copacetic note going into his final season with the Raptors. I don't know what's in store, if he's going to get traded this summer, if he gets traded next year, the deadline or whatever it is. But, um, you know, I, I really came to appreciate Chris Boucher as like a, a locker room veteran guy mm -hmm. this year. Um, really seemed like he, you know, was like kind of very steady and professional through a lot of weirdness. Uh, all of his pals getting traded away and stuff. It, it was uh a, a tough one for Chris Boucher, and, and I hope that they can handle whatever his exit looks like a little bit more gracefully than it seemed like they were handling it this season. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anything else, no, Katie? No, that's a that's a that's a fair point, and yeah. I think like maybe the remnants of that are like some of the decision making we talked about earlier, mm -hmm. where like that's not the best thing to dangle and then just have like fester at all. Yeah, for sure. Especially if you're trying to turn over a new leaf with some of these new guys, right? Mm -hmm. um, you don't want them to think like, oh, down the road, like this could be, this this how I could be treated. Mm -hmm. So yeah, not 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 such a positive thing. I got one more bad thing, Katie. Okay. Okay. Uh, this is like <laughs> a lower stakes one for sure. But uh, my my other rapid fire bad is how little the Raptors seem to like figure into the equation of the play uh, of the in season tournament. Um, where like they started last of any team, like three weeks after the tournament started, they played all their games in a matter of like 12 days mm -hmm. and were basically eliminated after two of their games because all the other teams had played games and put wins on the board. It, it just felt like they were just like never involved in it, which was a bummer because I have been one of the proponents of an in-season tournament for like a decade you have. and it felt like we got robbed of a fun little in-season low stakes, uh, you know, chance to go do some fun stuff or at least feel like you had some stakes in any of these games. None of those games felt like they had anything to them because we already kind of knew how the board was taking shape 
in well, Group C, the hallowed Group C. I think the Raptors were in. Um, yeah, that, that, that was a bummer. I, I, better layout of the schedule for the Raptors next season in the in season. Do you think that season, was honestly okay. like a scheduling anomaly? They were like someone it, it must was like, been. yeah. Oh shoot, I forgot about the Raptors. <laughs> <laughs> Better cram all these games into one <laughs> single week. Very possible. Um, yeah, very strange. Hopefully they figure out the scheduling a little more effectively next year. Because I want to enjoy the in-season tournament. Damn it, I want to get up for a must-win. You want to gamify game. a game. You're Absolutely. a big fan of that. Maybe. 100% I am, Katie. You have no idea. Um, we're going to leave it there. That feels like a good place to leave off the bad. Uh, we will turn the page to more positive looking things, I'm sure. Plenty of draft talk and everything on the way. Uh, Jamar Hines will be along tomorrow. We might play a game of what's more likely that's always fun or a would you rather. One of those fun little parlor games we'd like to lean on when the content is thin here on the pod. Um, again, draft stuff, that'll ratchet up, especially after the lottery on May the 12th, once we kind of know where the Raptors will be. If you want to go listen to yesterday's podcast where I talked about uh, the pick falling at 19 from the Pacers and options if they win the lottery and Alex Saar and a scouting report on him. That's there from yesterday. Uh, lots of great stuff for you to go check out on the pod this week, last week, and future weeks to come. Katie, anything you want to promote for the good people out there? Yeah, I'm pretty proud of a thing I wrote about Blake Griffin and his retirement on yeah. Basketball Feelings. I also narrated it for the first time. Substack has added a feature where you can read the thing that you wrote. Awesome. Um, and I was kind of curious how that would be. It was strangely cathartic. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, I really enjoyed writing it. You can read it at Basketball Feelings. Also, I I guess I can now an announce quote. Uh, we'll I'll be doing exits again this year, the playoff yeah. series. Um, have a lot of good guest writers lined up this year for that because I awesome. don't want to write all of them. <laughs> I don't know that I can write about the Sixers getting eliminated again. <laughs> So you yeah, find some Kyle Lowry nuggets in there, Katie. Oh, true, uh, fair, fair, yeah, fair, fair. Uh, nice silver lining. Anyway, yeah. you can subscribe to Basketball Feelings. Everyone, go do that. Uh, as a paid subscriber of Basketball Feelings, it is literally the best basketball writing I consume each and every week. I cannot recommend it enough. And I'm not just saying that because Katie's here, okay? Uh, <laughs> so everyone, go and uh, and support Basketball Feelings and all of Katie's fantastic work over there you can find me at woodley sean follow subscribe rate review on your favorite podcast apps of course we're on youtube as well go subscribe to the channel always appreciate new faces showing up there in the comments and whatnot uh and we will be back again on thursday with our pal jamar hines as we continue on the off season it's just starting out get ready there's going to be so much more pascal siakam sadness no i'm going to try to limit that because i think it might actually be turning listeners off but uh <laughs> we'll continue to talk about the raptors offseason as we go ahead till tomorrow thanks so much for hanging talk to you soon Bye bye